Thank you very much indeed. Our, our last session this afternoon, folks, is at 2.45, and it follows a moment when you might not be in here. Now, you know the security guys this morning were a little awkward in letting you in. If you leave early, they will be a little awkward in letting you out. Okay, so if you are tempted to make a little early exit, just be aware, there are 25 policemen for every one of you, so <laughs> don't even think about it. Come back in here, and we're gonna have a fantastic panel session. We were just wondering whether we could get any more chairs along here, and I've got uh, 30 minutes to do a panel conversation. Just come along for the fact that that could be the biggest challenge ever seen, and it will be very interesting. It's all about women in STEM, and we've got some fantastic people up here. So that's at 2.45, it's a good way to end the day. Um, certain presenters have certain riders. This next presenter had a rider which says, take away the bloody lectern, I don't need it. Okay, hence why I'm now doing this. It's taken away what I was using, but it's all right, because if there was a lectern on here, probably blow it up. Um, because our next speaker does all sorts of things like that. He's uh, best known as the surfing scientist, hence why he's over here in WA, because conditions are good. Are they good today, surf up? You don't know. <laughs> the surfing scientist doesn't know, but anyway, he's presented science experiments, stories on ABC television since 2004. He's appeared on Catalyst, Sleep Geeks, Studio 3, Sunrise and Roller Coaster. But I think this is fantastic. In 2012, he became the first ever resident scientist on Play School, which I think is wonderful. It's going to be a great speech. Mr. Ruben Meerman, please make him welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And Sorry, the reason I don't know what the waves are like today is because I can't go. <laughs> so the last thing I want to know is that it's pumping. Um, so my talk this afternoon is about the gigantic gap in your health literacy and mine until I discovered it. Um, I discovered this gap in my health literacy when I lost a little bit of weight. So here is a picture of me surfing and this, you can't make this up. It's this photo that made me start to wonder about this question that we're going to talk about this afternoon. Because in this photo, when I saw this, I noticed I'd become a little bit overweight. And um, that's literally just a few months after we filmed that Play School uh, um, series that we did. So when I look back at those Play School segments, I see someone who was, well, this is me then. Uh, and when I decided that I should lose some weight, because that's what doctors, dietitians, and personal trainers tell you, and the World Health Organization, all I did was ate less food and moved a bit more. So literally, I just counted kilojoules. Here's what happened. I shrunk, and uh, I lost 16 kilos. Now, I'm a physicist by training, and as I was losing that weight, I couldn't help but wonder, where does it go? If you lose 16 kilos off the scales, where do the 16 kilograms end up? And uh, I've been infatuated by this ever since, so much so that I published this paper in the British Medical Journal. It's two pages. You can read it at your leisure. It's 850 words. It's not much. There's two figures. This figure here is what really got me published. When you lose weight, when I read the biochemistry, I was absolutely stunned to discover that it all turns into carbon dioxide and water. Nothing but. So you lose 10 kilos of fat. I wanted to know if it's all turning into carbon dioxide and water, and this is not news, by the way. We didn't know this fact when Captain Cook sailed up the East Coast. We didn't know that when you burn stuff, it turns into carbon dioxide and water. No one had figured that out yet. So that's 1770. By the time the first fleet sailed into Sydney Cove, we did know that when you burn stuff, if it's organic, it turns into carbon dioxide and water, nothing else, right? Uh, that's if it's fat. If you burn protein, we'll get to that in a minute. If you burn protein, you get a little bit of, well, when you and I burn it, we make urea and we pee that out. But when you're losing fat, you don't get any other byproducts, carbon dioxide and water, that's it. So when I discovered this back in 2013, the first question that hit me was, so how much carbon dioxide do you breathe out? If you're losing 10 kilos, how much of it comes out of your lungs? And how much turns into water? And that had never been published. So you can read my paper and see how I figured it out. I, I used other people's research 
it's amazing to me to this day that no one had ever bothered to do this calculation, but there you go, I got it into the British Medical Journal that when you lose 10 kilos, 8.4 of those kilos will come out of your lungs. You breathe them out. You have no idea it's happening. Uh, I had no idea it was happening. And the 1.6 kilos that becomes water, well, that just goes into your um, body water, it's called. It happens inside your mitochondria, which I reckon all the biology teachers will have heard of. And so that water that's made inside your mitochondria goes into your body water, and then you lose it in all the usual ways. You wee some out, some of it comes out in feces, some of it comes out if you cry a lot, tears, there's a gazillion ways to lose it. Now, here's the thing that blew me away next. Figure one in this uh, paper is the results of my survey. I asked 150 doctors, dietitians, and personal trainers the same question. When you lose weight, where does it go? And the number one answer we got was that it turns into energy or heat. For the high school teachers in the room, let's just focus on this for a second because that breaks the law of conservation of matter. Before a chemical reaction, you'll have some atoms. After the chemical reaction, you'll have exactly the same number of atoms, but they've changed. We call it metabolism. You've, you've swapped them around. Things have happened. Um, the correct answer, three of the dietitians got this right. And I'll just double down on this because I've been attacked by a few people who have said, oh, but you just didn't ask the question the right way. I asked this question the right way. I said to these people, I interviewed the dietitians myself on the phone, and I said to them, when you lose weight, where does it go? Energy, most of them would say. Then I said, OK, so let me just check. You're, if I lose 10 kilos, where in the cosmos do they end up? And they still said energy. So they're forgetting grade 9 and 10 chemistry. Right? It's not getting in. Let me remind you of this. Those doctors, 50 of them, when they were at school, guess which kids they were? The highest achievers, because they got into medicine. So the way we teach this stuff is broken, it doesn't work, and I'm on a mission to try and fix it. So I'm going to teach you how we can fix this, but we're going to have to muck around with the curriculum. There's a brand new curriculum. There is zero appetite for curriculum change but I'm going to convince you that we need to do it. Because, look, here's just a few more results. We did this at uh, Uni of New South Wales. These results are not published yet, but we surveyed uh, third-year biochemistry students. They've already done uh, all of the biochemistry they're ever going to do. Same answers. Second-year biochemistry students, in the very lecture that they learnt about fat metabolism, they still said this. Uh, these students are from colleagues in Toulouse did the same with some medical students straight after they got all their biochemistry. Another colleague in Helsinki did the same thing. It's not an Australian problem. It's not an English-speaking problem. It's everywhere. And two more papers have been published since mine that corroborate, in fact, based on my paper, this is a lovely feeling when other people um, repeat your study and cite you, it gives me goosebumps because they got the same results. So I'll just show you what's wrong with the idea of turning fat into energy. We can show you what's wrong these days. This is a, um, I'm not promoting this particular kind of camera, but in my hand, I'm going to plug into my phone a thermal imaging camera, um, and I'm gonna crash out of my talk, and I'm gonna just use some software called Reflector to reflect my um, iPhone onto the screen. I'm sure you can figure out how this works. Um, it's just using the Apple TV um, protocols, if it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you just got to sometimes roll with the punches, don't you? Um, reflector, come on, baby. So it just it's exactly like using an Apple TV, but you can just do it from your um, phone. So here is my iPhone screen reflected onto the big screen. If I turn on the normal camera, I can point it at you guys. Actually, better turn it the right way around. And um, so kids go absolutely nuts for it when I do this. Um, they, they love it. And if you turn the camera back at a picture of itself, you can show them the concept of infinity. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit glitchy. But let's turn this one off and turn on the thermal imaging camera, and I'll tell you what's wrong with the idea of saying that um, when you lose weight, it turns into energy. I'm a physicist, and so if you go to my YouTube video on this, in that talk I said you can't turn atoms into energy or you can't turn weight into energy. What I meant was human bodies cannot convert atoms to energy. So here you all are, 
glowing. If it was dark, we'd be able to see you glowing in the dark. It's quite amazing. In fact, here's an amazing thing. Here's a black balloon. If I put the black balloon in front of this camera, I could still see you through this black rubber because this infrared light goes straight through this rubber. Whereas if I take this uh, same camera and put a glass in front of it, an ordinary drinking glass, I can't see you anymore because infrared light does not get through this kind of glass. It's opaque in infrared which is why you don't feel so hot when you're sitting behind a glass window with full-on sunlight coming through it, because the infrared is blocked by that window. And look, just one more thing. Here is um, a kettle. Kids go nuts for this. If you uh, pour some water, watch the screen and you'll see it looks like lava. And now the glass will start to get warm and I'll come back to that in a second. Here's an even more amazing thing, keep watching. Here's my foot. Um, I'll splash a little tiny, tiny drop of water. Don't panic, um, convention center people. Just a little splash of water next to my foot. There it is, right? In about 10 minutes, that splotch will be colder than the carpet next to it because it will radiate away its heat. And I really mean it's radiating. It's turning into photons of infrared light. Now there's my foot. I'll move it away. I've left an impression there. This will make it even clearer what's going on. If I drag my foot on the ground, that carpet is now glowing. Now, guess what? Those kilojoules, which is how you measure energy, which is how you measure photons, there's not a kilojoule in one photon, there's picojoules. But those photons, which are now just pure energy flying around at 300,000 kilometers per second, I ate that energy. It's the kilojoules in the food that you eat. You turn them into, mostly, photons of uh, infrared light. It's how it comes out of you. When you lose weight, you do not turn 10 kilograms into photons, right? You turn it into carbon dioxide and water. So let's move on. This, is, this bit of kit here has changed my life. I teach in 100 schools a year or more, and I teach at universities, and now that I can show people this live, it is absolutely amazing. It's transformative because now we can teach people where energy goes when something happens. Most of it turns into infrared light, just about always. Anyway, let's get back to uh, the process of what can we do to get this into kids' uh, education. Look, <laughs> right, we'll just stop mirroring here. Stop mirroring and, and then we'll get back into here. Um, so, uh, please do buy one of those for your school if you've got a bit of budget lying around. It doesn't have to be the Fleur one that I'm using, but um, since I published that paper, I've realised that actually I, I'm having so much trouble teaching adults this stuff. This basic fact that you turn your food into carbon dioxide and water, it's so hard to teach people, and the reason is they haven't understood a single thing we taught them about atoms and the periodic table. Don't take my word for this, ask your friends. They don't get it at all. And so here is a little uh, question that you can ask your friends, and I did this at Bondi Beach just a few uh, weeks ago. Check this out. Um, what's the gas that you're inhaling out of the air that's keeping you alive called? Oxygen. 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 And um, what's the gas you exhale because you're alive? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Now, third question. Um, where do the carbon atoms in the carbon dioxide come from? Oh. Oh. Carbon atoms in the carbon dioxide. Um, I've got no idea. <laughs> Wouldn't have a clue, mate. <laughs> I've no idea. <laughs> yeah, got nothing on that one. Uh, um, wow, good question. I should have concentrated more <laughs> on chemistry. Like, where do carbon atoms come from? Or hmm, pollution? Or fumes? Gas? <laughs> Cars and stuff? I don't know. Yeah, vehicles? Don't know. Cow poop? <laughs> <laughs> should know, but don't know. All right, so it'd be somewhere in the body, right? Uh, out of my lungs. My lungs? From the environment? Your cells, maybe, a bit of use then. From um, living things, maybe from the blood? From plants? Uh, my chemistry days are over, I've <laughs> got nothing. <laughs> from uh, uh, the food we eat? 
you nailed it. You got that. Really? Um, yeah. Okay. So you eat it? Yeah. Oh. yeah. We eat it? From what? <laughs> Have you heard of carbohydrates? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah? Oh. Oh. What do you okay. reckon the carbo bit means? Carbon, carbon dioxide. Probably carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide. There's a connection <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen together? Yes. <laughs> carbon carbohydrate, yeah. It's got the same word. <laughs> yeah. Never thought, it's CHO, so it's carbon, hydrogen. Okay, interesting. Yeah, what do you do for a crust? I'm a PDHPE teacher. We all giggle at that, and I've asked dozens of uh, PDHPE teachers. Um, it's actually not funny. They should know. It's actually a scandal that everyone is meant to have learnt this stuff in school. So I won't get too heavy with you here because we're all educators and I didn't know this stuff a few years ago. But we should be very, very concerned that people are escaping high school not knowing that you eat macronutrients and you breathe out 75% of the weight of those macronutrients. Three quarters of it comes out of your lungs. So um, what can we do? Well, here's something that I do with grade one kids. I show them soft drink. And um, this is regular, this is diet, exactly the same brand, exactly the same volume, except this one's regular, that one's diet. And I ask them, if, what, what's it going to do when I let it go, float or sink? And little grade one kids, you know what they're like, float, sink, sink. And then when you let it go, yay, if they got it right. <laughs> but watch this. This is the same stuff, lemon flavoured, but this one floats. And so when I do this for little kids, I'll say, which one's heavier, this one or that one? And they all say, that one, because it's obvious. And then I say to them, right, so get this. If I drink this and you drink that, let me teach you the most counterintuitive fact about your body. If I drink this drink, but I weigh myself first and you weigh yourself first and we write down how much we weigh and then I drink mine, you drink yours and then we weigh ourselves again and then we subtract the two numbers that we've got. We both got a bit heavier, but who got a bit heavier than who? Even grade one kids know, whoever drank that one. And the counterintuitive fact is that if you drink that one, the only way for that extra mass to come out of your body is via your lungs. You have to breathe it out. So let me show you a little shocking fact. And I'm going to pick on Solo, not because I don't like it, but because I do like it. I drink this sometimes, and there's 69 grams of sugar in that bottle. You can read the label and check for yourself. One teaspoon is four grams, so there's eight grams. And I've got to count out 17 and a, half, uh, 17 and a quarter of these. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and a quarter. And when I hold that up in front of little kids in schools and say, do you think that's the right amount of sugar or is it a bit too much? They all in a chorus go, a bit too much. <laughs> it's like, it's music to your ears. And anyone can do it. You don't need... To, it's simple. Now, what's not quite as simple, and I'll quickly show you, the reason I got so into this, uh, probably more than anyone else who's discovered that you breathe out the uh, weight that you lose, the reason I got so into it is because I've been using liquid nitrogen in schools for 25 years. And so I've been freezing balloons with this stuff and doing just a whole show on you know, the properties and interesting facts you can teach with liquid nitrogen, I'm just going to freeze a balloon. But hopefully you've all seen this stuff. If you're a high school teacher and you don't use this, you're crazy. You should definitely get this as often as you possibly can. It is the best teaching tool on the planet. It's nowhere near as dangerous as we've been led to believe. Um, so I do training courses on how to use this safely. It's, so, it's no more dangerous than boiling water. So if you're using um, a container like this, uh, a container, a um, coffee plunger flask, you don't really need to wear gloves because I'm not going to pour it over my hands. Now, I'm going to, uh, I usually get a kid to do this for me, blow up a balloon. Oy. That's a cheap one. 
Um, it doesn't matter whose breath this is. Because all humans, all mammals, breathe out the same composition of air. Which brings me to my balloon bouquet. This bouquet of balloons is how much air I breathe out in one hour when I'm asleep. That's my resting metabolic rate when I'm sleeping. Uh, or actually, it's just my resting metabolic rate, full stop. When I'm sitting still or fast asleep, I need to breathe in 360 litres of air per hour. It's so that I can get the 3.5 millilitres of oxygen that I need for every kilo of me into my blood. So we all need 3.5 millilitres of oxygen per kilo, per minute. Do the maths. It means I need to breathe that much air in one hour just to get this one balloon worth of oxygen into my bloodstream. That's how much goes into my blood when I'm asleep. And this is how much carbon dioxide comes back out. If you fill a balloon with oxygen, it weighs 20 grams. If you fill a balloon with carbon dioxide, it weighs 27 grams. Again, simple maths. The extra seven grams in the balloon of CO2 is the carbon atoms, and they came from the food you eat. And I can show them to you. We can pour liquid nitrogen over a balloon, and it will do what it always does. It will shrink. But because I'm using a transparent balloon, you're going to be able to see inside the balloon the oxygen is turning into liquid and the carbon dioxide is turning into solid dry ice. So I usually take dry ice to schools with me as well. Um, there is enough content in what I've just told you in the last 20 minutes to fill a semester. In fact, there's enough to fill 10 years of education. There is just so much goodness in here. Uh, but Again, I'm not wearing gloves because balloons are not good conductors of heat, so I'm not going to freeze my fingers just by touching it for a few milliseconds. Um, but now when I take it out, this is where it gets nice and interesting. I'm going to use the torch in my phone to backlight the uh, balloon. And if you're sitting far away, sorry that you won't get to see this as clearly, but if you're sitting nice and close, I'm going to make the top of the balloon transparent. And then if you look inside there, you should be able to see some liquid, yeah? And um, if you hold a magnet near that, you'll discover that it's a paramagnetic substance. It's attracted to magnets. That's because of quantum mechanics. Uh, but Let's forget quantum for a sec and get all of that to disappear, which means boil away. The boiling point of oxygen is minus 183. It's all gone. Now, see that powdery stuff in there? That's exhaled carbon dioxide and a little bit of water vapour that's frozen as well. But watch this. If I breathe on it, it vanishes because it's dry ice. It sublimes. And now you can see why most people don't realise that they're breathing out their food because it's back to normal. It comes out of you as an invisible gas. You don't feel it. You can't tell that it's heavier than the air that you're breathing out, but every single breath that you exhale is heavier than the breath you inhaled. And that's something we should all leave school knowing because the solution to the world's biggest health crisis, the obesity epidemic, and I was overweight myself, so it, this is the world's touchiest topic, right? weight loss and obesity, but the only solution for obesity is to breathe out more carbon atoms than you eat back in. There is nothing else that you can do that will do it. I mean, yeah, okay, you could get liposuction. But apart from that, if you want the fat in your fat cells to come out of you, you have to turn it into carbon dioxide and water and breathe it out. And we need to teach kids that because none of the adults that I'm talking to know this stuff. So I might go back to my talk for just a second, um, the slides, and I'll just try and shock you into the fact that um, you really do need to... Oh, what's happened here? Um, you really do need to breathe out more carbon atoms than you eat back in. If you're not breathing at an accident scene, the paramedics will breathe for you. 
I've spoken to paramedics about this. They don't know where the carbon atoms come from. In fact, on March the 2nd, I'll be talking to all the nurses at the Bundaberg Base Hospital ICU unit. They do the breathing for their patients with a ventilator. They don't know where the carbon atoms in exhaled carbon dioxide come from. And they've learnt this stuff at uni, but we don't connect the dots for them. So if you are um, unconscious at a accident scene, then the paramedics will breathe for you. And in the past, they used to use a little bit of like litmus paper on the ambu bag, which changes colour when carbon dioxide hit it because carbon dioxide reacts with water and makes carbonic acid, which reduces the pH. So that little bit of paper will go from purple to yellow. And if you're gold, you're golden is the old term in emergency medicine. Well, um, it's called capnography when you measure the carbon dioxide in someone's breath. Capnography. And these days we do it electronically with uh, infrared light. We shine infrared light through your exhaled breath stream and carbon dioxide absorbs infrared. That's why the other great crisis facing humanity is happening. Infrared light going through carbon dioxide makes it get warmer because it absorbs it. So here's the other side. This is why there is global warming, because we're pumping more CO2 out. Now, check this out. When you're breathing normally, this is a normal capnogram. When you exhale, there's carbon dioxide going past the sensor. When you inhale, there's no or very little carbon dioxide going past the sen sensor. Um, you should be breathing about 14 to 20 times. There should be about 4 to 6% carbon dioxide in your breath. If you are breathing too much, and number one question that I get asked about weight loss is, oh, so just <laughs> breathe more. Try it. Um, <laughs> because here's what will happen. You're pumping out more CO2 than you're making. And the amount in your body will go down, and you will get the jitters, you'll get tingly lips, and you potentially will faint. So don't try it. Um, some people have asked me, oh, so if people are overweight, is that maybe because they can't get rid of their CO2? Have you heard of photosynthesis? You cannot turn the carbon dioxide once you've made it inside your body. You can't turn that back into glucose and then back into fats. Plants can do that. We can't. And it's high school science that is meant to teach us that. And we all escape not really getting it. So if you... Um, hypoventilate, don't, if you don't breathe enough, the amount of CO2 in your blood goes up. And people with um, uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, like emphysema, they end up with too much CO2 in their body. It's called CO2 retention, and it's terrifying for them. They become nervous, and it's a horrible feeling by all accounts. So that's um, capnography. Now, check this out. I'm going to show you a video. It's from a paper that I absolutely love by Dr. Chris Reed, who flies with the emergency chopper out of Western Sydney. He intubated cadavers, so dead people, who'd been frozen and thawed back out, stuck a tube down their trachea um, to see if you get the same capnogram out when you start pumping air in and out of that person. Watch this. is there is carbon dioxide coming out, but every time they breathe in and back out again, there's less. If this was you in the hospital, this is called a medical emergency. If you're not pumping out CO2 at the rate that I'll show you in just a second, uh, it's 2.6 to 2.9 millilitres per kilogram per minute. If you're not breathing out that much CO2, the doctors will panic. What's wrong? Like what? And the, one of the reasons could be is that your heart has stopped beating and therefore your lungs are not perfused with fresh blood. So that would be a reason this might happen. Um, but if you're alive and well, that should not be happening. So in the ICU ward, the doctors are looking for these figures. That much oxygen going in, that much carbon dioxide coming out. Um, there's some beautiful chemistry here. For every 100 millilitres of oxygen you consume when you're burning carbs, you produce 100 mils of CO2. If you're burning fat for every 100 mils of oxygen that you're consuming, you'll breathe out only 70 mils of CO2. That's grade 10 chemistry. 
we, sh we should all be able to understand what I just t uh, showed you there, but if you're a primary school teacher, how many of you are primary school teachers, by the way? I expect you to have forgotten all of this, because <laughs> I, I, I did as well. So don't feel like, you, don't, please don't be sitting there thinking, am I supposed to know all this? Because, trust me, hardly anyone I've asked does. So if you chuck the numbers for my body weight into this, um, into these figures, you'll see that I have to breathe out 15 litres of oxygen per hour in my rest state. Um, let's just look at the carbon in that, just the carbon atoms. It adds up in a day, just my resting metabolic rate. This is before I get up and walk around. 150 grams a day, that's one kilo a week. In other words, if I don't eat, I'll lose at least a kilo a week, for sure, guaranteed. Uh, I breathe out, if you add in all my physical activity, I breathe out much more than I weigh, just in carbon, every year. But I eat just as much back in, so my weight's stable. Now, wouldn't it be great if kids knew that? So I'll finish off with why there is a obesity crisis. I've just showed you how much uh, sugar there is in this bottle of soft drink, so I don't really have to go through that again. If you want to oxidise all that sugar in that soft drink, you need to add 77 grams of oxygen and you will uh, produce 106 grams of carbon dioxide and 40 grams of water, and it'll release energy. Uh, there's 20 grams of oxygen in one of those balloons, so that's four of them, and there's 27 grams of carbon dioxide in one of those, so there's four of those. I'll produce four balloons of CO2 by burning that much sugar. So how long is it going to take me to burn that much sugar in my body if I stay still? It's obvious, right? It's four hours. I've got to breathe out 97 balloons worth of air just to get the four balloons worth of CO2 out. It's going to take four hours if I sit still, but if I go for a walk, one hour, because my resting metabolic rate is increased up to four times what it is, because you're using the biggest muscles in your body. Walking is the best exercise you'll find. Um, if I jog, it only takes me half an hour, but please don't start jogging straight away if you haven't moved for a year or two. <laughs> uh, so that's the bottle of Solo. Let's compare it to a Boost Juice Gym Junkie. I've got nothing against Boost Juice Gym Junkies. Most people would agree, oh, well, there's some vitamins and minerals and stuff in there, so it's probably a little bit healthier. And it, I would dare say that it is a bit healthier than the um, Solo. But if you chuck those numbers into my little equation here, helps to know the average protein formula for a human. There it is. If you know that formula, then you can calculate exactly how much of each of these things you will make when you burn this stuff. And guess what? It's still four hours. So what about a chicken salad sandwich on wholemeal bread, organic, grown on the north side of the hill, blessed by a monk, all the things? Uh, chuck it into my little equation here. It's not my equation. It's science's equation. It's still four hours of breathing. So these three menu items all take four hours to exhale at rest if you're my size. An apple takes one hour. A fun-sized Mars bar takes an hour and 10 minutes. A regular one, three and a half hours, and a king size, five and a quarter hours. I see people leaving the servo with those in between lunch and dinner, filling up their car, smash in a quick Mars bar, and grab a bottle of Coke while you're there. Uh, it gets better. If you're trying to lose weight, don't drink soft drink. It's four hours of breathing you're going to have to do on top of what you would have done anyway. <laughs> so have water, and you're back to normal. Um, if you, and my sister owns a cafe, very popular up in Bundaberg, so she peddles this stuff, coffee and cake, three hours and seven hours. I see people go in there and eat 10 hours worth of breathing between <laughs> breakfast and lunch. It's amazing, right? Kids go nuts for this bit. A, a, uh, well, this one is, looks a bit like a Big Mac. It doesn't really matter what kind of burger it is. It's seven hours for that one. Chuck in a large fries, 13 hours. Chuck in a large soft drink, 16 hours. Bash in a large sundae. There's a whole day's worth of breathing before you've done anything. So that's why we have an obesity crisis. And teachers are the solution. And it's primary school teachers who are the solution. And tomorrow, I'm going to give another talk in here about the periodic table and how you can teach it in primary school and how kids love it. Primary school teachers are the solution for this um, because grade one kids, if, please try this if you don't do anything else as a result of my talk. 
please show kids the periodic table and tell them what it means, what it is, and you watch their little faces when they see the word gold on there. Miss, miss, gold, gold. And, oh, silver and aluminium. They absolutely can't get enough, but grade 10 kids, <laughs> what do I need this for, sir? <laughs> so um, please just show it to them. Don't set any other criteria. Just show the kids the periodic table and they will love you for it. And tomorrow, um, I'll give you a whole hour of how you can make the periodic table come to life for children. But in the meantime, if you're trying to lose weight, and I'm not suggesting you need to, it's the world's touchiest topic. But if you are trying to lose weight, then um, I've just got one thing I always finish with this. If you want to lose weight, eat less, move more, and keep breathing. <laughs> Thank you. That was so good. So I see why you now got a job on play school. <laughs> Thank you very much. How do you put all this in your suitcase when you're traveling around? Um, that is just so good. Uh, and we have finished early, but did you want to take any questions? Because um, with a few more minutes, I just thought it's worth, you know, because I think what you just did today would be so inspiring in, in, in class. I know my kids would come back saying, what a great science teacher, instead of the ones that they do occasionally complain about. But is that controversial? <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that you've seen many examples where they get excited by something like that. So, so what, what, what do you think, how do we, with curriculum, how do we put some of this in? Because I know that's one of the issues that always crops up. So um, there is a teacher who I'll talk to you about tomorrow called Ian Stewart. Uh, I'll put all his details up on my personal website blog. In 2012, I saw this guy on the 7.30 report teaching atomic theory to grade three kids and four kids at Ithaca Creek State School in Brisbane. And I danced around my lounge room because I didn't know you could do that. Because I've been convinced by the curriculum people that uh, children that age can't understand this abstract concept of an atom. And that's because of Jean Piaget. We'll talk about him tomorrow. It turns out that actually you can teach little kids about atoms and most primary school teachers will be nodding going, of course you can. They can understand that everything's made of little things. So what we need to do is just train the teachers and give them some resources, uh, which I will use these tomorrow, but we, we've now got these beautiful resources thanks to Ian Stewart. These are called sticky atoms. They are magnetic. So instead of... Um, having to poke with molly mods for the teachers who know about molecular modeling kits. These little things just click together with little magnets. So there's H2O. And um, we've got videos of kids learning with these. In fact, I've got Bangkok Patna School over in Thailand has been running with this for a year uh, as a result of me doing all this stuff for their teachers. And those kids are lapping this up in grade one their grade six kids, sorry, grade five kids, have already learnt the um, uh, equation for respiration for glucose. Uh, it's, it's so doable, mm. is the answer. And, but you need resources, right? You, we don't want teachers to have to make these themselves out of styrofoam balls and take all that extra time. We, you, need, you need these. They're amazing. Sticky atoms, they're called. I should be his salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a question for Ruben? Anyone in the thing? If you haven't got a question yet, let me show you how I teach kids how plants make food. Because with these things, it is so easy to teach children quite young. I mean, I've done this with uh, grade ones in the room. I, I visit 100 and something schools a year. And so sometimes I have mixed age groups. Some schools, you know, I get the whole school, you know what it's like grades one to six all sitting there. And the grade one kids get this just as well as the grade six kids do. So I'm just quickly whipping up a carbon dioxide molecule here uh, so that I can get to it nice and quickly. Come on, get over there. Um, right, so I've made a carbon dioxide and I've made two waters. Here's how plants make food. First of all, they need water. So in goes the water up the roots. I'm wearing a, gl a green glove to signify chlorophyll, right? So the plant takes the uh, water molecule up into its roots all the way up into a chlorophyll molecule and chlorophyll can hold water just right. 
so that when a photon of sunlight hits that bond there, plucks that atom off. And when another photon hits that bond there, takes another uh, atom off. It keeps those, and it has to do it twice before I can finish this part of the cycle. So we need another water molecule, because I've got one oxygen atom here now. It does it twice. So another photon hits there, and another photon hits there. Boom. I've now got four hydrogen atoms to play with. And the plant then does this. It sticks the oxygens together, and that comes out through the little holes under the leaf called the stomata. And you and I breathe that. Every single oxygen molecule you've ever inhaled and lived thanks to was once two water molecules, right? It's an amazing fact. I love knowing that. And uh, step number two is it sucks carbon dioxide in through the exact same little hole, stomata, and it undoes these bonds. Now, this is a tricky process. It's called the Calvin cycle. So it's not, I'm not doing it in the right order here, but it ends up sticking all these hydrogen atoms that nicked from water sticks them to carbon dioxide, and we're, so we're hydrating carbon dioxide, we're making a carbohydrate. That's where the word comes from. And I could make, if I do it six more times, I'd have a carbohydrate. So good. You can teach this stuff to little kids. They get it, they get it. It's brilliant. Ruben, thank you for making it so real. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.